Howard W. French, author, Twitter handle HO French. It's a pleasure um, to be speaking with you today here at the Norfolk, um, at the same time as the US Africa Summit. Uh, Howard is the author of China's Second Continent, which I read one weekend after receiving it very kindly. Howard, I'd first like to touch on the book because it's this wonderful part travelogue through hard to visit African places. Um, what gave you the idea to put this together? When did the genesis of the idea come together? Uh, thank you, first of all, Ali Khan. It's great to be with you. I'm a fan of yours on Twitter, too. Oh, so I'm a fan of yours, too. <laughs> yeah, we've, we've, we've picked up stuff from each other. It's That's been right. very pleasurable. Thank you. Um, I, you know, I worked for the New York Times for many years. I was a correspondent in, in, in West and Central Africa in, in the 90s. Um, and then I went to Asia. I worked in Japan for five years and then China for six years. And while I was in China, I, I lived in Shanghai as a bureau chief there and in an in a, in a office complex uh, that had been one of the first Western property developments in Shanghai after the opening of the country. And as such, it was the sort of favorite venue of visiting foreign head of state delegations. And my office looked out upon the entrance to this office complex. It was a hotel office complex. And I began to notice in the sort of er middle of the last decade the arrival uh, of more and more African delegations. So we're talking two of four, two of five. That's right. Mm -hmm. More and more African delegations, head of state delegations mm -hmm. to China. And having spent most of my life up until that point involved with Africa, I thought, you know, sure, there's something interesting going on here. Let me find out what it, what it is. And this led to me doing a series for the New York Times about this burgeoning new relationship between post-reform China and, and Africa. And so I went off and I did a three-country series for, for the New York Times. In 2008, I left the Times and I joined Columbia University's Faculty of Journalism. Uh, and I did a piece then, shortly afterwards, uh, for Atlantic Magazine, in which I traveled. I took the Tazara Railroad uh, all the way across Tanzania to the terminus in Zambia and then overland by road into the Congo. Uh, what year was that? So that was in 2009. Mm. Um, I set off to do a piece that was sort of generically about this big relationship between China and Africa, but I discovered during that trip uh, at sort of a very sort of close ground level this phenomenon of just explosive Afri Chinese immigration or migration to Africa. And although my Atlantic piece wasn't about that per se, this planted the bug in my mind to do a piece that looks about not just the big relationships that are being forged, but the sort of undercurrent of human relationship th via migration that was taking place uh, of Chinese people essentially coming to Africa to set up shop t to, to build new lives here. I, d I found that fascinating and a number of things I learned actually about that immigration. First of all, you estimate it to be about a million uh, immigrants. I tweeted it today and somebody came back to me and said, Ali Khan, it's way higher than that. So, uh, you know, do you feel a million is the right number? I used a million in the title only because um, that's the, in, in the academic conferences and the various kind of talking shops mm. about this subject, that's the commonly bandied about number, but no one really knows. Mm. In the book, I actually say my own r rough guess based on my own anecdotal sense of thing, traveling through more than 15 countries in the year on yes. the ground that I reported this book, is probably two million is closer to the number, but we, we really don't know. I mean, there may be 100,000 Chinese in Nigeria alone, uh, maybe more. There may be 100,000 uh, or close to 100,000 in Zambia. Mm. Um, so that's two out of 54 African countries. You know, uh, if you begin to do the math, you, it, it comes a, becomes apparent very quickly that a, that a million probably is insufficient. Yeah. And what I found interesting, whilst we just dwell on that immigration saga, is that it, it, you, were, you were saying that a lot of these people all came from one particular part of China, not a particularly prosperous part of it. And I found that quite interesting because when I look back at our history four or five generations ago from India, similar sort of story, unhappy with the economy there. In those days it was Gujarat coming out here for better opportunities. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, so, so is that correct that the I, I, that the majority of these immigrants are coming from a particular area? There's something happening there that's driving them towards Africa. So, what happened is in the middle of the 1990s, China begins to survey the world, and it says to itself, "We've had a fantastic run since mm -hmm. the late the end of the 70s when Deng Xiaoping begins to reform the economy. We have set up um, local 
investment zones in China that run on a capitalist basis. And we've attracted capital from, in the first instance, from Hong Kong and then from Taiwan and then from um, foreign Chinese communities in the Western United States and in Australia and other places to jumpstart our economy on a kind of globalized capitalist level. That carried us so far. In the 90s, the Chinese had the foresight to understand that whatever their great success initially, that would only take them so far in the future. Mm. And so they said, we have to go out into the world and capture our own markets. We, have to, we, have to, we can't just be the recipient of inward investment. We have to be the agents mm. of economic activity around the world. And they selected Africa as a priority zone via a very astute calculation, which mm. said, look, you know, at post-Cold War, the West is preoccupied in other places. There's this huge continent called Africa, a billion people, where the West essentially is not you know, behaving in any particularly vigorous or, or imaginative way. This is the place where we can strike. We can capture these markets. We can beat the sort of tepid Western competition and, and our um, fledgling uh, corporations that would like to become global brands, they can establish themselves in Africa. And so the Chinese government in 1996 sets forth formally a policy called going out. Mm. Uh, Jiang Zemin was the president there. And he tells uh, the, the way the Chinese system works is that the center, meaning Beijing, the Communist Party, creates policy and sets priorities. And then makes the, the, it rates mm. the provinces on the basis of how well they perform according to various policies. And so going out becomes a policy. And the provinces are set into competitive motion against each mm. other in terms of who gets the me most business in this new priority realm called, China, called Africa. And so you see African uh, countries becoming the scene of great economic prospecting by Chinese construction companies with the, Chinese, the central government providing the financing for this. And, and, the, the, uh, and the state companies, which have a provincial, provincial identity and basis to them, start creating um, sorry, projects in one place after another. We've all seen them here in Africa. Railroads, stadiums, mm -hmm. airports, uh, ports, highway systems, sometimes housing developments, et cetera, et cetera. All built with Chinese state funding, all built by provincial level but state-owned companies coming from various places in China. The migration that has taken place subsequently mm -hmm. has largely been a feature or a factor of the companies that come from the provinces in China that have been relatively less developed. Yes. In other words, companies from Shanghai, which is very rich, or Tianjin, or they Beijing, or Guangzhou, where yeah. they're all relatively quite rich. These mm. are all Eastern, prosperous Eastern Chinese places. They may have come to do business in, 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 in Africa according to this watchword of go out. But the people from these provinces have pretty much good lives and great prospects back in China already. The people from Sichuan or Henan or Hunan or Hubei or Hebei, I'm sorry, some of these to an unfamiliar audience may sound like similar sounding names, but these are all the names of sort of central and central western provinces mm -hmm. in China where, where the economic takeoff has not happened as vigorously as on the eastern coast. They send their construction companies here and the workers dis discover, wow, first of all, all of the myths and stereotypes that they have heard of Africa may, are, are largely untrue. Mm -hmm. There's not wild r animals roaming the streets. You know, people are not necessarily attacking them or mobbing them or behaving in a xenophobic way. In fact, often being very friendly to them. There's all these economic opportunities that people with relatively low skill sets and relatively modest capital mm. can involve themselves in. And so the people who came from these parts of China where, Im where, where opportunity had been relatively low or stifled, come to an African environment, yes. and everywhere they look, they see opportunity. Yes. And so a 2,000 member construction crew may see 10% of its workers decide, well, I'm gonna stay at the end of my two year contract. I'm gonna stay in Kenya, or I'm gonna stay in Zambia, or Senegal, or where have you. And here's where the interesting thing takes place. As those initial arrivals, mm -hmm. as a result of this going out policy, begin to set up shop in various African countries, and have their own successes, word seeps back to China that neighbor Joe or neighbor Lin or neighbor whoever, who you thought of as being a very ordinary guy, now he's rich. Mm. He, he, he created an ice cream factory in Malawi or a shoe factory in Zambia or got farming land in Mozambique or did what have you and has now made it. And he's sending pictures back home that is creating an emulation factor yes. where lots of other ordinary people from his same province, his own social set, are saying, wow, if he can do it, I can do it too. I'm going to Africa mm. to also. 
And so each of those, you so know. So it's been a summoning power from that's these. That's right. Yeah. It's a pull factor mm -hmm. that has, I think, been the key. That yes. this emulation has really driven things exponentially and is not finished, by the way. This will continue into the future. Now, when I read your book, what seemed to me w w quite interesting was a differentiation between the Chinese, this million-man Chinese immigrant uh, community that has come, which in some ways, when you were, when you were doing these face-to-face -face interviews with, with a fellow in Mozambique, I remember very clearly, mm -hmm. um, some in West Africa, they were happy to be shot of the Chinese government. They saw this sort of African continent as a blank canvas where they could, you know, where they could live their life more fully. How do you, you know, I, people look at China as very monolithic. Is it, or, or, or who are, you know, are these, the, these people seem to me like renegade, you know, characters who were, uh, you know, like anyone else looking to get away from the state. Is, am I wrong in that analysis? Um, so here's what's going on in the lives of this kind of character. They come from an authoritarian country that has provided in the last generation quite good returns for many of its people, from, for, for a great many of its people, right? But which is nonetheless repressive in many ways. Mm. First of all, along with authoritarian political power comes a lot of corruption. Mm. The state is always hitting, or the party is always hitting you up in one way or another mm. for money, for licenses, for payoffs, kickbacks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Alongside of that, there's very little outlet for expression or criticism. You cannot openly, you can talk openly to your friends, but you cannot speak in a broader kind of social way about the frustrations of life or your, especially your criticism of the, of the state. They arrive in an African environment. Now, in the West, and even among many Africans, a prevailing sense of Africa is in, in many places. I don't want to speak too, in too broad a generalization, but in many places of how you know, corrupt things are. They arrive in an African environment and they have quite the opposite impression mm. that this is a freewheeling place, that there, there is nobody following them around, that, that you know, yes, they may have to pay a bribe here or there, but it's not nearly as systematic or as uh, you know, attentive mm. as the, the f type of corruption that they face in China. And so they've got a monkey off of their back. They can breathe freely and ex exert their own kind of genius and ent entrepreneurship mm. Um, and even talk freely about China if they wish to. That's right. there's to you. To yeah. me all the time yeah. and to each other and to write about it online for mm -hmm. that matter. That's how I found some of these people. So th th that's very interesting that, you know, we have this two-tier. We have the state operating in a certain manner or this very flagship type things where there's huge commitments to the continent mm -hmm. and then this entrepreneurial class which, like so many other entrepreneurial classes that have come to Africa, has done extremely well. Mm -hmm. Going, um, continuing with w with your journey, which by the way was fascinating, was it started I think in Maputo, did it not? That's right. And then it, it was absolutely fabulous. I don't know West Africa as well as you did, but mm. uh, and my favorite piece of just from the travelogue was when you caught up with your brother, and I, you described spending a night in the desert, I think, in Namibia. Yeah, that's right. And you have the stars very close to you, and I, I remember that. It was, it was very powerful. Um, so congratulations Thank on that. You. Okay. A couple of questions which I want to come back to, given, you know, we've got this very big U.S.-Africa uh, summit. If I can just touch on, I'm sure you're bored to bits being asked this question, but ten, people tend to see it in a binary way, U.S. versus China in Africa. H how do you, how do you co contextualize this? Um, is, is, it, is it a collision? Is it a win-win? <laughs> Uh, is Africa winning because we've got more trading partners than before? How would you, who holds, who holds the balance of power in this relationship? How do you see it? I, I think that um, Africa is entering into a moment of maximum possibility for itself. Mm. Not only has it been growing very fast for the last several years in general, mm. But as everyone knows, there are two other kind of boons that have taken place. There's a technological boon that has created a communications revolution for Africa mm. that has made Do it... Do you notice that yourself? Oh, absolutely. That has made it possible. Uh, you know, my wife is from West Africa, and yes. we were talking last night about how uh, in the old days when we lived in West Africa many years ago, how difficult it was to make an appointment with someone. You, yes. if you either you catch them while they're at their desk or yes. you don't catch them yes. because, you know, they don't <laughs> have, <laughs> that's the only way. And so you have to keep going back to their office and it's hit or miss on how much time, how much time you would waste in that process. That's gone now, yes. right? And this is just a very small piece 
of what it means to have had a communications revolution. So there's these, these technologies which are just completely erasing yes. all sorts of barricades and hurdles that had, that had stymied Africa's mm -hmm. economic, the sort of momentum of life in Africa. Yes. Um, and that's really important. That's a great way to characterize it. At the same time, you have w what a lot of people have commented on, which is this demographic b boom yes. uh, that has risks to it, but which also yeah, but Everyone keeps saying it's a dividend, but it does have risks. It has risks, for sure. I mean, historically, historically if you've got lots of young men without a job... That's you've a got trouble, yeah. And so you asked me about win-win, which is actually a Chinese propaganda term, which, which I have problems Well, uh, you were one of the few people who described it as such, and I'm tired of hearing it because it's yeah. really like a trope now. Yes, and it's patronizing. That, it's you know, very patronizing. You know, what we're doing is, you know, of equal benefit to mm. both parties. Well, nothing could be further from, from, for, 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 from being takeable for granted, if you will. Yes. Right? But... It's, there is a win-win prospect for Africa mm. in having so many international players be interested in Africa for s uh, at the same time. Mm. You know, in the, in the Cold War, you essentially had two blocks that, yes. were, that were competing for Africa. Now you have a, a kind of um, a, a, a multipolar world. It's mm. not just China. Mm. China is the biggest of the new players. Yes. But you have India, you have Brazil, you have Turkey. Turkey mm. is a big player in Africa today. That's right. You have Malaysia and Vietnam. Mm. You have all of these people who are uh, peoples who mm. are coming sort of uh, awakened mm. about Africa and what Africa means to the world. Mm. And this is an opportunity for Africa. Um, it's only meaningful, however, to the extent that African countries Unfortunately, the continent is as balkanized it is yes. as it is, but it's getting only more uh, getting more so. Only more meaningful to the extent that African countries understand that this is a perishable moment. Yes. The demographic dividend is perishable, and the fascination, this, this sort of nascent fascination yes. with Africa that we're seeing all over the world is perishable. Do you feel that our policymakers, African policymakers, appreciate that? Or do you think, you know, they think it's a lottery and this is, you know, the new normal? I'm afraid that too many, my sense is that too many people think that this is, you know, something they can take for granted. And it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's something that's owed to them. Yes. That, you know, yeah, we've been neglected for all this time. They're finally awakening to us. Mm -hmm. You have to earn the sustained attention. It's one yes. thing to get the initial attention, but to, to keep the attention, you have to earn that. Yes. And that only happens v via serious work. Mm. Making, first of all, serious calculations of what true national interests are. That means yeah. That's my biggest issue. I don't think many African governments understand what the national interest is. Most is. African governments are very poor at that. What they have is the interest, typically, of a very narrow elite really that is yeah. essentially rent-seeking. Yes. You know, and... The foreign partners. Have you seen change in that? The aspect? foreign partners can read this. Mm. They know what a rent-seeking elite is, mm. and they know how to play the game with mm. a rent-seeking elite. And so, this is very dangerous for Africa. Mm. I see here and there countries that are beginning to broaden their sense of what national interest is and yes. to think more seriously about this, but not enough of it. Who's the leader in thinking <laughs> that way, in your opinion? Well, you know, I think you can make a fairly. Uh, um, uh, important co um, uh, correlation between countries that have a kind of a genuine sense of democracy kind of coursing through their lifeblood uh, and a ripening sense, not a mature yet, but a ripening sense of national interest. Yes. So in a place like Ghana with all of its problems, yes, and Ghana yes. has had a lot of problems re very recently very with recent, the yeah. currency, you know, and ex this is a classic Ghanaian problem of you know, um, coupling the election cycle with, mm. I with irresponsible spending, mm. you know, so that the incumbent party can try to win the election. Mm. However, you've had a, a, a pretty interesting conversation with Ghana about managing resource, new resource wealth. And I think this bodes well for the future. I think, you know, the, 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 the tapping of new resource wealth in East Africa, which is going to be massive, yes, is, be. is at an earlier it's going to be massive, it's a, yeah. I do, yes. but it's in an earlier stage in the in its life cycle mm -hmm. than it is in Ghana yet, and so it's hard to know mm -hmm. just how serious the national interest discussions are going to be in these places. I I wouldn't say that the initial signs are terribly encouraging here. Here, East Africa. no, mm -hmm. that uh, you know, yeah, I don't East Africa. You're talking from Mozambique. Up. I'm talking Mozambique, Tanzania, mm -hmm. Kenya, Uganda. That uh, you know. Um, uh, the, I'm afraid that the idea of a windfall of mm. um, essentially hydrocarbons, yes. um, it, uh, you know, the, wh how, what this means and how to manage this properly and how to get the maximum benefit for a broad national interest yes. has not been 
discussed and debated and most importantly integrated into the kind of political mm -hmm. class That's discussion as it needs to be. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing, you know, so you have typically in these kinds of resource play situations uh, a 20 or 30 year window mm -hmm. where the known reserves are going to be drawn down. Mm -hmm. and. Yes, in some cases, new minerals, and, or in some cases, that same resource will be more, more and more will be discovered. So 20 or 30 years doesn't express the full mm -hmm. life of it. But let's say you have a 20 or 30 year run in oil or gas or what have you, right? Mm -hmm. That's an opportunity to turn this underground wealth into above ground mm -hmm. wealth. What does above ground wealth mean? Above ground wealth means you have created a different kind of human landscape. You've created a population base that knows how to create wealth mm. through its own ingenuity, invention, labor, effort, uh, uh, you know, entrepreneurship, mm. right? Uh, that comes via education. That comes via creating a, a kind of predictable set of rules that are enforceable, that are unbiased, that are not regional or sectarian or partisan or tribal, et cetera. You know, uh, and, and frankly, there's not enough mm. Uh, of, of that kind of ethos yet in the East African discussion so far as I can I That's can a tell. very interesting point. I want to return to the point of the US and China just briefly one more time. I think it, it was in your article I think in Business Week where you were talking about how the Chinese see Africa as an El Dorado. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. And you were saying in the same article that uh, the, the US tends to look at Africa, ungoverned spaces, Al-Qaeda recalcitrants through a counter-terrorism prism. Mm -hmm. Now, when I look at, I, obviously that's clear, and, uh, and to me, do you think the U.S. Has, still has a decisive military advantage on the continent through U.S. Africa Com and, and through control of the sea lanes, or, or do, you, do you see the U.S. having a, a, a hard power influence over the continent? The U.S. has a hard power influence over the continent. The continent uh, has a certain reliance on the United States to help provide a kind of underlying security and, and, and protection against all kinds of non-state actors, et cetera, et cetera. But vis-a-vis -vis China, mm -hmm. this American reflex to mm -hmm. see everything in security terms is arguably to the disadvantage of the United States. Yes. In other words, the United States is so preoccupied with seeing Africa in these terms that it can't see Africa mm. as clearly or as readily as it needs to see Africa in other terms. Here we have Obama meeting this week with 40 or so African mm. leaders, right? Um, supposedly, econom the, the economy is supposed to be a highlight of, of this. He's got 200 chief executives apparently on the sidelines. Yes, and so there will be a lot of deals struck, no doubt. But um, my early sense is that the United States cannot really get away mm. from a security conversation. Um, and. You know, the way China, the, the, the way that China has made up so much ground in Africa mm -hmm. so quickly is by being focused. Mm -hmm. The Chinese have said, we'll free ride on the American security obsession. Yes. We'll let the Americans take care of that. Was someone saying, if you take South Sudan as an example, they're free riding on that there? Well, South Sudan is a bit of a special case. Mm -hmm. I mean, they are more or less free riding, but the Chinese are more proactive in mm -hmm. South Sudan than they, no. are mo than they are in most places in okay. Africa. In other words, They've invested enough in South Sudan that they feel that they need to be players politically and mm. even to have a look in in terms of the security arrangements mm. of South Sudan. In most of Africa, the Chinese said, look, you know, so look, we have to ev ev evacuate how many tens of thousands of Chinese people from Libya? That's right. Let the Westerners help us. We've yes. had to ha evacuate people from Chad. Let the Westerners help yes. us. You know, we have to be on the lookout in Nigeria. We'll, we'll rely on the Westerners to give us the intelligence or the security help mm. in a pinch, right? Yes. In South Sudan, they're being a bit more proactive. So do you, th you think that model is going to change as their investments become big like they are in South Sudan? I think that China is, um, uh, I, I think that the rules of power in the world are, are, are not particular to any nation. And yes. that as China becomes a great power, meaning as China develops entrenched and very important economic and human resources around the world, China will begin to see its power in terms of those resources. Mm -hmm. The need to be able to project power, to protect their interests, uh, and to protect their people. Mm -hmm. I think it's inevitable. And we're seeing the beginnings of, the Libya thing was mm -hmm. a wake up for China. We yes. have, you know, we've got all of this business in Libya and suddenly we have to evacuate lots of people. We need to have a capacity mm -hmm. for that in the future. In fact, we need to have a capacity to be able to intervene somehow, mm. whether overtly, directly, or not, 
in the future in sensitive pl places in Africa so that we don't have to withdraw our people. In other words, preemptively or proactively become engaged in this taboo thing called the internal affairs of other countries. Let's go from there because that's been a great selling point. You know, as, Af as African leaders receive these Chinese visitors, say we don't want anything to do with your internal affairs, that's your business. In the background, you've got the US ambassador saying, what about democracy, what about human rights? Mm -hmm. And it seems it has played in the Chinese favor, has it not? Because, has it? It, it does with regimes. Yes. So, that's, be, that's because the regimes are not necessarily thinking, as we said a moment yeah. earlier, about, you know, broadly defined national interests, but yes. they're thinking about narrowly defined rent-seeking opportunities. They think non-interference is a great thing. Mm. That doesn't mean that their people agree with them. Yes. That doesn't even mean that the broader elites agree with them. Mm. It's a convenient thing if you're sitting on top of a pile of cash and chopping, as they say in Nigeria, wantonly, yes. to have someone say, look, you know, we're not going to interfere in your business. You yes. do it however you want. We yeah. just want you to sign the contracts and pay us as we agreed, right? But the risk here for China is that, you know, as a number of these situations go bad, Yes peoples in one African country or another begin to see China as part of their problem. Mm. Uh, and I don't think the Chinese are, are, are sufficiently attentive to this prospect yet, or, or perhaps the problem is slightly different. That their political system, there may be people who are attentive to this, mm. but their political system is unwieldy and, and unable to respond quickly and, and nimbly mm. to the changing circumstances on the ground. They're dug in, in terms of the ideology of non-interference. It appeals to them for a particular domestic reason. Mm. China is, uh, in a sort of old world sense, itself an empire. Yes. You have the central yeah, yeah. part of the country, which is Han Chinese people, mm. 90 some percent of the population. And then you have the entire rimland of China, yes. composed of 54 ethnic minorities, yes. who have one degree or another of ambivalence about being called Chinese or being, or being subjected, subjected to Chinese rule having to live under this system, subsumed into the greater China. And so China knows that this is a very fragile concoction that came into being very late in terms of the modern history of the world. Only in the late 19th century did this sort of thing begin to gel with, what, with Xinjiang, the great northwestern Muslim province, and Tibet, and various other pieces sort of coming to be consolidated into what we see as China on the map today. And so China knows mm. that you know, at any moment things can go really bad in China and yes. they don't want other people interfering in their situation. Yes. Yes. They don't want some foreign country or the so, UN or yeah. any other actor saying, you can't do this, you can't do that, mm. or we're going to interfere. So you think the whole internal uh, affairs policy was driven by a Chinese? Very much. Very much. Yes, that people should not interfere with us. Correct. How interesting. Now, um, if I may come to a couple of other points that, that were made. Um, do you, you know, everyone says that Africa, they talk about it as one continent, but when you read through your book, I mean, Windhoek to, to northern Mozambique, where you were with the Chinese farmer, um, to places in West Africa, what's your, I mean, how would you respond to people who say, you know, it's, who seem to think that this is one continent? You called it a Balkans in a way. Mm -hmm. How would you, you know, how would you distill that? Well, it's one of the great handicaps of Africa to be so balkanized. I, yes. mean, I think that's the best word to describe it, 54 countries, or some, depending on your definition. Um, uh, this means that Africa doesn't have the easy opportunity of very large and consolidated markets, with very few exceptions. You know, Nigeria is a very big market. Ethiopia is becoming a very big market. Kenya in the future will be a, a big market. Kenya is a, a relatively large country. But most African countries are not very large. Mm. Uh, and you know, so you have the re replication of systems and of costs uh, from one place to another. Mm. That is a, just a huge, people talk about, you know, the, the ethnic feature of r randomly drawn um, borders around Africa, but that's not as big as the economic cost, I don't think. Um, the barriers, you the, mean. The barriers, mm. right. And the depth, so you've got a, if you have a, if you have 54 rent-seeking classes, that's mm. worse than having one rent-seeking yes. class, right? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, you're replicating these costs yes. and structures from uh, acro over little Togo, mm. Benin, mm. even Ghana is a fairly small country, you know, Gabon, mm. Congo Republic, these mm. are tiny places. Mm. Each of them has, uh, you know, a firmly entrenched 
you know, class of people who are skimming lots of stuff off the top. And each of them has this, you know, they'll be going to Washington, each of them with 40 or 60 or 150 different people in That's the delegation, right? right? Yes. Um, you know, this gives you an idea of the replication that I'm talking yeah. about. But, you know, Africa is spoken about unlike any other continent as one. We don't say something happened in Asia today. No. We don't say something happened in Europe today no. or something happened in North America today or South America That's today. A good point. We only we meaning the media only speak about Africa in these terms. And it is this is another kind of handicap to it Africa. Is. Not only has the outside world meaning the European imperial experience colonized and balkanized Africa, but it has ref refused subsequently to accord any kind of individual specificity of attention to Africa. And so you get Africa spoken of as Africa as mm. opposed to something happened today in Tanzania or mm. something happened today in Senegal. Um, you know, there's an Ebola crisis in Africa. Yes. You know, is it a big crisis or was it? Actually, it's not a big crisis. No. no. Um, but it allows you know people to speak about Africa in ways that are resonant with lots of old habits yes. of danger and of diseases you know, we don't understand things being you know cam contamination <laughs> and infection and you know <laughs> th these are these are quite so persistent storylines yes. no, that, right. that exist. Sorry, I didn't mean to laugh. No, no, but I mean these are these have long lineages. These kinds of story ideas of you know these dark, dangerous things emanating from Africa, and so Ebola really fits that. Even though I mean it's a tragedy for the seven hundred or some pe so people who have died from it, but. Yes. It's 700 people, you know. Yeah. Um, I don't know the numbers, but I would wager that 700 people have died of malaria yeah. in the last week, you That's know, right. E easily, mm -hmm. right? Um, but, you know, malaria is not making its way to the West, and so, and it's not new. Yeah. And so it doesn't fit this kind of storytelling penchant that, that, you know, is so much alive in terms of the way the media relates to Africa. Ebola is not a, a yeah. big deal at all. Mm -hmm. Talking about the way the media relates to Africa, what I think is interesting is with what you're talking about technology and social media. Mm -hmm. I mean, given the amount of conversation that's now bubbling under on the continent by Africans, do you think that's changed that dynamic at all or you don't? It has a, a, a great deal. Mm -hmm. So it's allowed a number of things to happen. It's allowed conversations to take place among Africans across borders that never took place before. So anybody who follows in, who's act really active in Twitter, who has a lot of African f sort of conversations, will be aware that, you know, you have people chiming in from mm. Kenya and Zambia and Ghana and Nigeria and Ivory Coast and here and there, even across European language groups. Mm. There's enough people who can speak a common, you know, degree of English that they'll, that they'll want to ch chirp in. Mm. This never happened before. Mm. You know, Kenyans and ten Nigerians never spoke about yes, anything commonly before. Point. You have this conversation taking place via social media mm. that has united Africans intellectually, topically, conversationally in ways that just, you know, were unconceivable mm. previously. Another thing that's happened that's really interesting and important is that it has allowed, um, so one of the threads of this kind of conversation is a thread of response to the way the West talks about Ch Africa. Yes, yes, yes. And so you have a kind of critique mm. of the Western discourse on Africa that's taking place via, there's blog sites like, you know, Africa as a country. And, yes, yes. And there are many individual sort of self-appointed mm. critics on Twitter right. who say, look at this ridiculous thing that we're seeing mm. in the New York Times or in, in the Guardian or wherever, you know. Um, and did they ever think to talk to an African or did they ever think about this or that aspect of what they're reporting on? You know, how unreal is this? This is a new feature. Mm. Where I think this all leads to, and where I'm hopeful about mm. the power of social media in this regard, is that it may lead to something that has never really existed mm. previously in, the, in, in, in history. And that is a kind of media discourse from Africa about Africa yes. that has a continental purview. So there's Kenyans who've always talked about Kenya, and there's you know Congolese who've always talked about Congolese, but there has never been any real substantial body of Africans who have been able to sustain a conversation among themselves, an informed conversation among themselves about Africa. Mm -hmm. And there's not much African media about Africa. Mm -hmm. Some you know African intellectuals, and I understand the frustration here. They speak about the need to sort of tell our own story yes. and, and have our own conversation about Africa. That's never really been possible before. Social media and the internet, not mm -hmm. just social media, but the internet meaning internet-based publishing is yes. creating the possibility of having African audiences 
for material written by Africans, mm. by, for reporting driven by Africans for the very first time. And I think social media becomes an, a sort of a catalyst that helps jumpstart this. And I'm very hopeful that in the next few years, mm. we'll see lots of interesting publishing ventures in yes. Africa that yes. for the first time can really sustain African conversations and have an Afri a truly African perspective. You're doing some work at the Multimedia University, aren't you? That's correct. Yes, and is that looking at this sort of area? So one of the things we want to do, it's the Aga Khan New Graduate School of Media and Communications, is create um, programs in entrepreneurial journalism where we train people to think about the opportunities that technology presents to get away from old cost structures. Mm. You know, it's very expensive. We have an expression in, in, in the United States it's almost a cliche that the only freedom of the press exists for people who can own, afford to own a press, <laughs> right? But yes. in the internet age, you don't <laughs> have to buy a press. No. You don't have to print newspapers. <laughs> and so if you can create a certain kind of entrepreneurial spirit and know-how yes. among a young cadre of African journalists who have a kind of spark and intelligence and curiosity and drive in them, you know, we've seen a revolution of the media landscape in the West already in terms of very, you know, capable and vibrant competitors of the old um, sort of legacy media groups of the West, you know, mm -hmm. newspapers like the New York Times that I come from, yes. right? Uh, there are all kinds of media companies that have, that now compete in terms of dominating the conversation and national conscience in the United States and in other Western countries that never had to sort of hire 500 people and have a, a printing press and all the rest. And so this is a moment of Africa, of opportunity for Africa to kind of get go down that road mm -hmm. and and we in this school the GSMC of Aga Khan University we'd like to play a small piece of uh, a role in that That's yeah exciting. just as a catalyst as a as a training ground you know if I'm of course in the economics field so I'm interested to hear what you were saying about the economy I think uh, in an article today or yesterday you were either quoted or you're writing saying what the Chinese saw was not only natural resources. You said they saw a potential market and you had a high call number of three billion mm -hmm. consumers. That, that's right. Mm -hmm. So looking at that landscape, we overlaying the natural resource story on there. What are the countries, because you've been now involved in the continent for more than 30 years, what are, what are the countries that, from an economic point of view, if you would tell me, you know, imagine I'm, I'm, I'm going to look after your next $100,000, where would you send me on the continent? Well, you know, so our image of Nigeria mm. is, very, is, 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 is very often a negative one. You know, yeah. I mean, there are cliches and stereotypes of Nigeria being very chaotic and, you know, poorly run and yes. even violent place given Boko Haram and all the rest. Yes. I think of Nigeria as a place of just limitless possibility. Uh, you know, I mean, it's first of all, it's one, uh, you know, very large market that's growing, yes. growing very fast. Um, but it's also a country that's growing, that economically is growing very fast. And although it's by reputation an oil economy, most of Nigeria's growth is not oil related. It's services related. Yes. Um, and manufacturing related. And so Nigeria is a place that if I were to, you know, you give me $100,000 and say you're free to invest this anywhere yes. in Africa, that would be one of the first places I look. So I would take, extract from that a, a rule that would sort of guide my subsequent mm -hmm. prospecting. Yes. And that is, you know, unless you find some special opportunity and you're an investment pro and I'm not, so you could go to a small country and find some unique opportunity. Sure based on, as you said in our earlier conversation, just the inefficiency of markets. You know, the world doesn't really know in real time what's really happening in so many places. You yes. can unearth a gem somewhere That's that it's right. been un uncovered by other people. Yes. I don't have that opportunity as readily, certainly. So I would look for big markets. Yes. So Nigeria would be your top Nigeria market. Nigeria would be my so top market. So the majority of people feel the same way. Yeah. Ethiopia would be another, yes. another place. I mean, I would look for the demographic giants of Africa. Well, if you, have you been to Ethiopia? Lake? Yes, I have. Did you go in the book? I don't think you did. Uh, no, I didn't. But no, I went that's during right. the research for the book. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, when I look at things like internet statistics, mm -hmm. if you look at Ethiopia, internet penetration is something like 2%. Mm -hmm. If you look at someone like Kenya, it's about 57%. Isn't that going to hold back Ethiopia in the future? Or you think the model works in this, in this, in this type of moment? I think that Ethiopia is making uh, great strides right now for reasons that are related to the way that China has been able to take off. In other it's words, a similar, similar structure. No, well, so here's the thing. Most of what's happening in China over the last 30 years is not because the Chinese Communist Party has come up with brilliant policies. 
is because there were disastrous policies in place for mm. so long previously. Mm. So the most important thing has been stopping doing all the disastrous things. Yes. And not coming up with the great new ideas necessarily. China has had some good new ideas. Ethiopia has had some good ideas. But this isn't the main feature taking place. The main feature is stop doing the really, really horrible and stupid things and give people an opportunity to make money. And they will. Yeah. And so that's the major feature of why China has taken off, mm -hmm. I believe, and why Ethiopia has recently done so well. How far Ethiopia and indeed how far China can go, though, will depend on bigger questions. Yes. You know, and this gets into... We were touching on that. Why don't you mention what you thought were the bigger questions? Well, so just to finish on Ethiopia, I mean, I think that, and this relates to China, that there's, you know, that uh, a top-down, highly centralized, you know, control-oriented national policy, I think in the long run probably won't serve mm. Ethiopia terribly well. And so right now things look quite good, but to answer the, you know, your 2% internet penetration mm -hmm. rate problem, I think relates to this. The, the, the Ethiopian state is probably not terribly keen on making sure that every, everyone has access to the internet mm -hmm. and that people can have free and free-ranging conversations mm -hmm. on the internet. That inhibits their control. Yes. They would like to be tightly in control of many things. So you see it as a very similar scenario to what we have in China? Absolutely. This limits opportunity. And I think the Chinese have begun to understand with, uh, uh, begun to understand and are wrestling with the notion of how do you simultaneously relinquish control in social and economic ways, or I should say economic and social ways, mm -hmm. and retain control politically. The Ethiopians haven't figured, ha yeah, they're, they they're at a much earlier stage in this conversation. <laughs> That's not <laughs> Ethiopia. Right. It's how to get the economic <laughs> growth going. Exactly. Yeah. So you, those two are for you the sort of lodestars, the ones that you look out for. For sure. Um, and, and from an opportunity-wise, from what you've seen, because the experience you gained, I mean, you've met all kinds of characters doing all kinds of businesses. I mean, I was quite taken aback at the sort of things, in particular, the Chinese were prepared to do. Uh, one guy had sort of gone and got himself some land in Mozambique. You had another sort of factory maker. Um, looking at those businesses, what, how have they managed to do so well and become so entrepreneurial? Are they working harder? Are they better at business? What are they doing? They're plugged into China where they're getting some advantage? So part of it is that, that they have networks that go back to China and China is producing uh, goods, mm. you know, manufactured goods and providing credit uh, in ways that help the Chinese entrepreneur who comes here yes. outcompete uh, other rivals. Because Howard, one, I met this Chinese ambassador who told me, Ali Khan, you know, when our contractors do a project for the government, they can come to us and and present the cost and we will pay them and we'll go and collect from the government Correct. and given the credit issue in in Africa this seems to me to be a, a competitive advantage of Michael E. Porter territory. Huge. Huge. Yeah. Yeah. So the Chinese state is providing credit yes. for, for, for anything of any size that's taking place involving China and Africa. A lot of the characters in my book are individual entrepreneurs and so they're not... They were more individualistic. Than yeah. They're not state. taking state credit to do their thing. But bigger players are getting state credit and it's quite cheap and they get, as you said, the backing of the state. So if there's a collection problem, mm. the Chinese embassy will go after, the, you know, they'll put, right. they'll put the squeeze on the Kenyan government or whoever the government is and say, look, yeah. you know, we're doing all this stuff for you and you're not paying. Mm. Um, other, other kind of outside competitors, whether it's in the United States and Europe or in these other emerging countries, Brazil, Vietnam, Turkey, et cetera, they don't have that same yes. opportunity. Now, I, now, can I jump back to President Obama, our first African-American president of the United States of America, visited Africa for one day in his whole first term. Mm -hmm. Is his second term, is this summit today, does it mark a trend change in the way he's operating? Is he trying to reinvent this engagement or are the ambitions much scaled back and this is just more of a token effort? I think it's somewhere in between. I think that it's very unfortunate that Obama has waited this long, mm. uh, that he has not made much of an impression on Africa so far. But I thought he couldn't do anything. You were coming out of the recession in his first term. You're an African-American president. If you're cavorting around Africa whilst people are losing their jobs in, the, in, the, in middle America, it wouldn't have played well. I Except thought. unless if you make the case that, you know, engaging Africa vigorously is a yes. way to make money for America, which yeah. is the case. Mm. You know, I think that American, the American political system has been timid 
and unimaginative about Africa. Yes. And has, as I've said many times, has often only been able to think of Africa in security terms and humanitarian terms. It's yes. for a leader to redefine that and to yes. say, Africa is a billion people today, two billion people by 2050, three billion people by, by, three, by 2000. It's got the fastest growing economies in the world. It's got the fastest growing middle class in the world. It's the fastest urbanizing part of the world. Yes. We need to be in Africa, not because we're good people, because yes. we want to take care of Africa, because we want to vaccinate their children or you know, do other sorts of you know, humanitarian things, but because this is where the opportunity is for the future. Obama has, to, uh, any leader has to make, to make this happen, has to be able to make the argument, has to be able to be the piston that's gonna push this through. Obama has waited to the second year of his second term, well into the second year of his second term and into the month of August, which in Washington DC is known as the silly season. Mm. That's, when the, that's when nothing important happens. Yes. This is when, unfortunately, Obama has scheduled this thing. Now, I wow. don't mean to say that it me it's meaningless, yes. but he, you know, this too is a kind of a lost opportunity. Obama is entering the last two years of his presidency, which are known typically as a lame duck period. He's already, you know, fairly down in the polls and yes. has a very difficult relationship with Congress. You know, how far is he going to be able to, he's waited, here's a guy who you could argue had a historic opportunity given yes. his background with Africa, and he's waited this long to really engage with Africa. And, and co by contrast, Xi Jinping's first trip abroad was ended up in Africa. So the Chinese have a rule mm. that says every year, yes. either the Chinese president or the Chinese premier has to go to Africa. My goodness. Every year, a certain number of Chinese cabinet officials have to go to Africa. If you go back to uh, Jiang Zemin's going out policy in 1996, you can, pl you can, you can plot this on a, on a chart. Mm. The Chinese have been consistent at the highest level sending presidential, prime ministerial, and cabinet level missions to Africa every single year. That's how you demonstrate, that's called servicing the relationship. Wow. That's how you demonstrate a commitment and a sense of priority to something. The United States has not shown an, a, an ability to do this and that's why you see in this Obama summit, and I don't want to be totally down on it. I yes. think that it's good that the part of the role here of the president is saying, we don't need to be embarrassed about you know, promoting business in Africa. We want our businesses to do well in Africa too. There's an argument that this is good for Africa as well as being good for the Absolutely. United States, right? Um, but uh, the reason why a summit like this has to sort of be uh, an across the board, touch every issue. You know, I've been amused on Twitter to have people argue in the last week or two that either this is or this should be about health or this is or should be about education, or it is or it should be about energy, or it is or it should be about human rights, or it is or it should be about term limits or democracy or one thing or another. The reason why a summit like this has to be about everything and yes. try to satisfy everyone mm. is because the relationships are not being serviced. Mm. In other words, if you had sustained high level, it doesn't have to be the president or vice yes. president every year coming to Africa like the Chinese, but if you none, had a much more significant kind of high level sustained diplomatic engagement with the continent, you could have, you, you, uh, you could, you could disaggregate mm. these issues mm. and you could have an economic summit that was really about business and economy and a few months later or the next year or whenever you could have a democracy summit and a human rights summit and a healthcare summit and an energy summit etc cetera, etc cetera. they don't have all have to be summits but you can focus your attention on particular issues and really move the agenda in 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 pointed ways in specific areas without having to have this great kind of blur that's taking place with, I fear, with this Obama summit mm -hmm. where they feel like they have to, you know, everything's got to be touched upon, mm -hmm. which essentially means that in the end, almost nothing really becomes prioritized. Howard French, thank you so very much. It was thank you, really Alicante. a privilege. I've been following you for more than, I think, a, more than a year, even a longer. A couple of years. A couple yeah. of years, actually. And so it feels, it, it's, it's great to meet somebody offline when you follow them so closely and I really um, I urge you to read Howard's book. It's, it's called China's Second Continent. I read it in one afternoon sitting and my wife complained that I was ignoring her but I said I had to and it really was really remarkable and w a wonderful journey through the continent at the grassroots 
riding on public transport to get to A to B, going to the most extraordinary places, and, uh, and a love of Africa, which came through in so many different ways, which I really appreciated. Um, and again, please, if you haven't got it yet, go and get it. And, if you, and the place to get it is probably Yaya Center if you're in Nairobi. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Howard. You, Thank you. Great pleasure. No, it was mine, all mine.